I Wish Actors Knew, First AD Edition. Everyone, I'm Matthew Cornwell with Get Taped here in Atlanta, Georgia, one of Atlanta's original audition taping services, which I co-own with my amazingly talented, beautiful wife and best friend, Brooke. Uh, and this video is part of our ongoing series, I Wish Actors Knew. And today we're talking to the first AD or the first assistant director. For this interview, I was so excited to sit down with a friend of mine, Matthew Goodwin, who is a first assistant director here in the Southeast, and he has worked on some of the biggest shows, including The Walking Dead. So he was the perfect person to talk to for this video series. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. Thank you, Matthew, for being here. First question, since I am also a Matthew, do you have a distinction between Matt and Matthew personally and professionally? For a long time, it was Matt, but... When I worked on Lost with Matthew Fox, I appreciated how it made him sound older and sophisticated and mature. And so after that job, I started introducing myself as Matthew and have done so ever since. I love that. Well, thank you for, for being here and giving up your time for this. Uh, I, I've, I've already found with some of the interviews I've done that it's, it's, it's a whole treasure trove of information for actors. Talk about your journey. Uh, you're now a first AD, correct? And so what has your journey been from day one to now? So I spent my first year or so out of college riding around Chicago on my bike with a camera in my backpack, interviewing and, uh, and shooting footage for restaurant owners and uh, and residents and B-roll and all that, and then taking it back to the office and editing these little uh, real estate videos for people to watch and kind of get a sense of, of different neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, through that, I the, the small company that I worked for did a commercial that was semi-legitimate, uh, and there was... A guy on the set uh, of that commercial that kind of everybody was really listening to him and doing what he said, and it seemed like they were looking to him for uh, what was next and what to do. Uh, and so I sort of, before even realizing what that person was or what they did, I was interested enough to, to kind of want to do that job. Uh, come to find out, he was the first assistant director, um, and I told him that I would love to do whatever he does. <laughs> uh, and then maybe a few weeks later, after we had exchanged um, uh, information, I got a call from somebody that I didn't know that said, hey, can you work on Friday? And I said, yes. And then I said, who is this? <laughs> Um, so <laughs> that was my first uh, production assistant job on a movie called Fred Claus in Chicago. It was an overnight. It was seven degrees, uh, and I was locking up uh, Upper Wacker Drive in Chicago on a January evening. Um, and from there, you know, without getting into too much of it, for, you know, once I got on a set, um, I was able to just make friends, meet people, um, work hard, and you know, the next time that somebody had a job, I got on another movie and I got on another show, and da 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 da. You know, it's it was a snowball effect for me finding my way into the first set and then just making myself somebody who people wanted to have around. I wasn't good at anything, so uh, it wasn't that. <laughs> Just a charming personality. I was an atmospheric presence. <laughs> Unfortunately, we did not cross paths when I was on Walking Dead because they were shooting, uh, I think there was a different AD for odds and evens maybe as how, uh, how it was split up. So I'm not sure if we've technically worked together. My first movie in Atlanta was The Change Up. Ah! And I remember you from The Change Up. Uh, Hopefully for good reasons. Yeah, which was... I don't know what, uh, yeah, don't don't put this in there if I get it wrong, but were you like a construction worker or something yeah. on that show? <laughs> when the fountain w disappeared the next day, they showed up to hopefully undo the body switch. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, I will call myself out because that was one of the first real celebrity experiences I had and something that I didn't think about, which was you, th there's a whole discussion about asking celebrities for pictures on set. And without taking sides there so much, uh, other than uh, I love the philosophy of you earned your place on that set. So by asking for that photo, you're basically saying I'm not as worthy to be on the set as this other person. But I made the mistake uh, in retrospect of asking for a photo with Jason Bateman and Ryan Reynolds in full view of all the extras, you know, and because, you know, extras then see that like, oh, OK, that's allowed. And I don't know if they got bombarded by any extras after that, but uh, that's 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 my my PTSD from that that experience is I realized like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should have, if anything, if I, if there was a quiet moment away from the crowds, maybe do something, but, um, but that's cool. That's, that's awesome to, to create that connection. So let's sort of, um, start talking about your actual interaction with actors. And because of your experience as second, second, second AD and first AD, um, we, you can sort of dance around the answer based on those different positions from your department, uh, which position generally would call the actor uh, before they have uh, either to welcome them to the show or to maybe coordinate that first yeah. that wardrobe fitting first interaction that an actor is going to probably have with a member of you know i'm in the assistant director's department or ad department um, as soon as we get a deal memo so once you've been booked on the job and it's finalized, that deal memo is going to go out to costumes, hair and makeup, you know, producers, assistant directors, and that deal memo has got, uh, you know, basically your contact information and a little bit of information about how you're to be perceived or treated on set. It'll have usually your uh, the trailer that you're entitled to um, and any you know, most people don't have them, but any special conditions of employment, like must have 17 bottles of Fiji water in their trailer before they get there, you know, any riot or riot. Yeah. So once we get the deal memo, the second AD, who is essentially second in command in the assistant director's department, um, second AD who's in charge of paperwork, of interacting with the actors, um, making the call sheet, giving out call times, da 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 So the second AD is going to get that deal memo and reach out to the actor. Um, usually, uh, it's just a high hello and possibly um, a time to go ahead and start setting up fittings or hair and makeup um, consultations and whatnot. Um, but as soon as the deal memo goes out, a second a, a good second AD is going to reach out and at least introduce themselves, even if they don't have any more information at the time. So when I get that phone call from that second AD and whether or not there is any information about wardrobe fitting or, um, you know, tentative schedule or anything like that, is there anything that that I should any red flags, things that I should bring up at that point? I think when you make your first introduction with somebody from production, you know, whether it's an assistant director or some, or a, it might be someone from costumes may get to you first. Um, good things to say in those uh, conversations are if you have uh, visible tattoos, um, it's something we want to know because uh, everything that's on camera, including tattoos on your body, they've got to be cleared. So, even if you have a tattoo that you think has nothing to do, it couldn't possibly be someone else's property, we've got to see it. We've got to, you know, get clearance even sometimes from the tattoo artists before we can show that on camera. Um, and our hair and makeup departments and costume departments are going to want to know, you know, if you have a sleeve of tattoos uh, that aren't in your headshots we're probably going to need to put you in long sleeves or we're going to need to cover those tattoos. So tattoos is a big thing. I think also if you have a hair color that's different than, you know, definitely if it's different than whatever you auditioned in or have gotten a haircut since then or you 
had a beard in the audition and now all of a sudden you have shaved it recently. So you don't look like the person that sort of <laughs> auditioned for the role. You want to let people know because they're not those are things that are much easier to solve if we have a little bit of heads up than if you show up and you look nothing like uh, the person who auditioned. I think also if there's any special needs that you have, um, not necessarily you know ADA things, but if there's any special needs like you're allergic to a certain type of food or you're, you know that a certain type of skincare product will, you know, make you react. Any of those little things that you can just give people a heads up on, that will just help you tremendously as you move forward if 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 any of those things are true. So that I think that's such a good reminder of uh because at that moment that second AD essentially is is the hub to all of those other departments. And even though I could easily convince myself like, oh, when I talk to costumes or when I talk to makeup, um, but to if since that's the first, uh, like you said, interaction, it'll give you the most lead time to then get that information to other departments or to get the approval. And I think while some people may think that that's being high maintenance, from my perspective, I want and need to know those things to be able to do my job well. Um, so if you give me <laughs> – the more information you give me, most of it probably – as assistant director is just going to look at and forget about because it doesn't ring, you know, it doesn't sound an alarm, but every once in a while there's going to be a thing in there that's really valuable information. I think the other thing to note, if for any reason you have hair, facial hair, or things that can't be changed because you are playing another role on another show, You'd be surprised how many times somebody comes in and they assume that hair and makeup are just going to like them just exactly the way they are. And we ask you to get a haircut or shave the beard and you can't do it because you're playing another role on a show where that won't match anymore that character's look. So um, again, all that stuff, there's ways of getting around all of it. We can wig, we can put your beard on. Um, but we can't do all of that at the drop of a hat. So, um, you know, more information is power for sure. Uh, when in doubt, over overshare any of those tiny details that you think maybe don't matter, but they might matter. They might, like you said, sound an alarm uh, for your department. Okay, so now that I've uh, navigated my first conversation perfectly, I've, I've shared all that relevant information. You have now. I have now. You weren't before, but you did now. I was just like, hey, what's up? Thanks. Bye. Um, see you on set. Uh, anything that happens around the wardrobe fitting, any interaction that I need to be concerned about with the AD department at my wardrobe fitting or any other interaction before I, my first day on set? Uh, I have kids. I have animals. Uh, a lot of people without warning have brought their children, have brought a partner, have brought a dog, a porcupine. I don't know. But uh, – when you go to your costume fitting, if you're going to show up with anyone, any other soul other than yourself, make sure you get it checked out. Um, we have had to have people sit and wait outside of the studio gates before for somebody who's getting a fitting because, you know, more and more, uh, if you're not uh, if you're not invited to set or to the studio, you're not going to get in most likely. So don't put yourself in that situation. If you have a situation where you have to do that, again, uh, let us know. We can make sure that it's fine most of the time. But if you just show up and you have a dog with you or a kid, there's a, always a chance that we're not going to be able to make that happen you know, immediately or instantly. And it's going to turn into a thing. Do ask for permission. Don't ask for forgiveness after the fact. Uh, because, you know, let's say it's an actor who has gone from they've worked 10 commercials and this is their first booking that's going to be taking place on a studio lot uh, behind a security gate. And so you're used to going to a, you know, a production company's little tiny office where they have dogs running around. And in your experience has been that it is very relaxed and it doesn't really matter that you, you know, you had someone drive you or whatever. But now you're on an actual gated lot where you have to have been pre-approved by security 
and they're looking in the car going, Who, who's this? Like, oh, it's just my so-and-so. I'm like, well, they're not on my list. And yeah. and now you're instead of being five minutes early for your fitting, you're potentially 10 minutes late. Yeah. And uh, and you've maybe just caused some wrinkles that, that don't feel like a great first impression. Um, yeah, that's I hadn't even thought of that because uh, I have cats. Don't plan on bringing a cat to, to a wardrobe fitting. Um, now that I'm on set, anything I need to worry about in those sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, that I might be at base camp, maybe going through the works, maybe then back relaxing in my trailer. Anything that that stands out before I get called to set. Just remember, uh, there's an assistant director behind uh, everything that goes on on set. Um, first AD, second AD, second second AD. There might be additional second ADs, and you know everyone's arrival times whether it's cast members, crew members, catering, it's all measured in six minute increments because we break things up in tenths of an hour. So when you get your call time and it says 8.42 a.m. and you're wondering why it's 8.42 and not 8.45, uh, that's just the way we do it so that you know on time cards and on call sheets, uh, everything is, you know, if it's 9.12, it's 9.2 or 9.7 would be 9.42 or 9.9 .9 would be 9.54. And that we really do break down your call time to six minute increments in what we are expecting of you. Um, and yeah, when your, you know, when your call time uh is starts on the call sheet, we're assuming that at, let's say it's 912, that at 912, you're either going to hair and makeup or you're getting dressed or going to costumes if you need a fitting or something like that. Um, you know, that's not to say that you're expected to be there 30 minutes early, but if you get there right at 912, that's okay. But right at 912, be ready for someone to come and say, hey, go ahead and get dressed and head into cut to hair and makeup. Or, hey, can I grab your breakfast order? Go ahead and head over here. We're going to start this. You know, uh, when that time starts, the base camp PA, the second second AD, the key second AD, you know, if they're doing their job they're going to be asking you to do something as soon as that time hits because that's the way that the morning or the afternoon or whatever it is is scheduled. You know, there may be 15 actors and stunt people arriving in a 30-minute period of time and that six-minute difference between your call time and the next person's call time is what's necessary to make sure that you don't all log jam in the trailer at the same time. Um, so it's all carefully considered. Um, so just make sure, you know, I don't think I'm not one that really thinks that you need to be there a half an hour early because honestly, as an AD who's, you know, been in base camp a lot, people who show up too early are just as frustrating as people who show up late. <laughs> the the times when it's okay to come early, really early, it are when if you're a person who really likes to like get your own breakfast, that's when I would say come early and get your own breakfast and then be back in your trailer and ready to go whenever your call time is. Otherwise, let us get it for you because we want to move the process along. It's not because we don't want you to get breakfast. It's because we want to get it for you so that you can start, you know, doing other things when your call time starts. That's a great reminder because uh, I think for some actors, you might go through maybe your th first three bookings were sort of the opposite where you had a call time of that was so specific, you know, 942. And, and you weren't even asked to go to hair and makeup for an hour. 
And then, uh, and then it was like, don't worry about getting into your costume. We'll, we'll let you know we're, we're running behind her or so you could then get lulled, right? That the next job, it's like, oh, another show up at nine 42 and wait for three hours. And then at nine 42, they're like, Hey, uh, makeup's ready, you know, hair and makeup ready for you. And so I think it's, uh, you know, be careful about what, what the last job taught you, um, other than it's not going to be the same and, and to assume that it is going to be worked down to the minute. It's a human puzzle. So there's only so many hair and makeup artists available at any, you know, given moment in time. Ultimately, the ready time for a group of actors needs to be 10 a.m. If there's 10 actors in the scene and there's only three hair and three makeup, that means only six of those actors can really be ready at 10 a.m. The other four have to be ready before that so that the last six can be getting ready for 10 o'clock. So, you know, as you go further down the call sheet is further down the numbers, it's not that you're less important, but decisions have to be made as to whose time is going to be considered the most. And that determination is always going to go to a higher number on the call sheet. And it's not out of disrespect. It's just out of logistics. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can't we can't magically make people ready. You know, assume that your downtime as an actor, especially as a day player, that your downtime is going to be after hair and makeup, that the best thing that you can do is come get yourself ready in an expeditious manner and then probably you'll have your time to hang around and, and get situated and all that, you know, after you're dressed and hair and makeup have seen you. And I, cause I think as an actor who is day playing and sitting around, it can, you can start to go down that rabbit hole of negative thinking of like, what, why, why did they call me this early if they didn't need me until, um, and so I think if we maybe change our perspective a little bit, um, it helps to alleviate some of that and give more context. And, and, and trust me, we think about those things, uh, you know, especially as someone who's married to an actor, I am very empathetic to the plight of being an actor. It's an incredibly difficult job. So when you're working every day, it's really difficult. But also when you're working one day, I would say it's just as difficult because you have to get integrated into the system, comfortable as much as you possibly can, which is not very much, and perform, and then you're done. So as soon as you maybe feel like you've gotten the hang of things, you're out, you're on to the next project. I have a lot of sympathy for the people who are in and out in one day because you're being asked to perform on a dime. Whereas if you're involved in a series for a longer period of time, maybe your first couple of days are a little bit tough to get into the groove, but eventually it's just what you do every day. And being a day player is incredibly difficult to come in, perform, be first in the hair and makeup trailer, have your scene pushed to the end of the day to make room for something else that's happening, and then to be sort of <laughs> thanked and sent out the door uh, to go and try and do it again. <laughs> Anything that, that veteran actors do, and not necessarily the celebrities, but just yeah. the ones you can tell have been on many sets that they do that green actors could stand to to kind of learn from? Yeah. I mean, I think the adage that you catch more flies with honey is certainly true. Being pleasant reaps a reward. I think that, you know, knowing that everyone is at work and we've probably been at work for many weeks before you got there, and we'll be at work for many weeks after you leave, and treating it kind of as a guest appearance. Like, he, there is a cast of characters, crew and cast, there every day, day in and day out, week in, week out, and that you're showing up to kind of add to the spot you know, the flavor of what's already happening. Um, so I would say being social is great, 
But at the same time, I think it's not that it's not that important because the truth is we we want to get to know you a little bit in the time that we have available, but there's not very much time to do that. So I think being confident, being uh, uh, being confident enough to ask questions if you don't know what you're supposed to do, uh, rather than pretending that you do know. You know, I've been in the business for 16 years, and when someone pretends to know how to do something, it takes about five seconds to realize that they don't actually know what they're doing. They may do an okay job pretending, but I would prefer if somebody doesn't know what I mean or what I'm expecting of them, that they just ask. I mean, most most crew members had a first day. I would say almost all of them had a first day, had a first week, had a first year in the business where they didn't know everything. Um, and a lot of people like, you know, being of service to others, you know. Um, if you don't know what you're supposed to do or you don't know what it means, assistant directors are a really good resource where, you know, even up to the first AD, if you have a question that you don't want to ask the director and I'm not running around with my head cut off, ask me. I would be happy to help and to assist you. Um, I, I don't think that you have to learn everybody's name, however many people you can remember. Um, is great. And the people that interact with you directly, hair and makeup, costumes, you know, camera operators, the dolly grips, the people that are going to be right there with you. Um, it's totally appropriate to introduce yourself, but don't feel like you have to get to know it. You're never going to get to know everybody and don't feel like you need to. And I think there's something else in there, like uh, uh, just not being afraid to ask questions. And maybe, like you said, if the first idea is, is, clearly stressed out. And so if the second or the second second, whoever maybe is there in between takes, uh, who maybe walks you back from rehearsal to to base camp, th that's the time to kind of like, okay, so he said on the day, we're we're shooting it today, right? And then, then they'll give you that sort of like, oh, yeah, that's just that's just terminology for when we actually do shoot it or, you know, this is what I tell production assistants who are getting into the business too. the best thing you can do is pay attention. You know, when you go back to your chair or you step off set for a second, put yourself in a place where, you know, that's not in the way uh, and look, get your head up out of the phone, look around, see what people are doing, listen to what they're saying. I mean, you can learn a lot about this business by just looking and listening Uh you know, if you could hear what's happening on the radio, you would learn a lot more, too. Um, but you probably don't want to. <laughs> um, you know, we communicate in a way that's um, uh, usually concise and straight to the point. And that isn't meant to be abrasive to people. But, you know, everything is a countdown in this business um, to anything, to lunch, to the end of the day, to the time when the miners have to go home. You know, everything is a countdown. And there are people like myself who are in charge of making sure that those timers never go off. Um, so when you're getting an answer, if it's on or near the set, expect just the answer. And very little, you know, nicety, you know, very little honey around how you get your answer. But it's not because we're trying to be, you know, mean or anything. I'm someone who maybe doesn't represent the average actor in that I'm infinitely curious about every department. Uh, I've produced a lot of stuff on my own, very low level compared to a full budget set. But, you know, I so then I'm a, that sponge for learning more about what a dolly grip does, what they're you know, responsibilities are versus uh, who the best boy is. And is it yeah. because they've been awarded something or, you know, and um, th my point being that um, if the rehearsal's over 
and we can kind of come back to the rehearsal in a second. But when the rehearsal's over and maybe there is some downtime or they're shooting other coverage that doesn't involve me. And so I've been invited or offered to go back to base. Um, and maybe it's a bus ride. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a walk. But either way, there are times where I would quite honestly rather stay and learn, um, whether it's at cast chair because maybe there's a monitor nearby or maybe I can you know hover around the sound cart because they usually have a monitor that and they don't tend to have a lot of physical movement at the sound cart. So I don't usually I'm not usually in the way. But what is and this might be the tone of the set from set to set. But, you know, what is that view of the actor who is not at their cast chair or back at base? Uh, I think you have to be careful being too curious. Um, I will admit if there were actors that weren't involved in the scene that were watching monitors, it would be it would be a little off-putting to me. Sure. Um, just because the, I mean, the monitors are, the places where there are monitors are sensitive places. Definitely don't hover around Video Village where the director and the producers and script supervisor and the director of photography are going to be. I would, you're you're well off to consider that a do not enter zone. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe if you're standing back around the sound cart and you can catch a glimpse, uh, that's probably fine. But, um, you know, it's a little bit taboo in that in that regard that the more curious you are, it might be more of a telltale sign of your inexperience. Sure. Um, which is a bummer. So I think that's just a good... Uh, reminder for us all, including myself, to uh, even though the curiosity might be well placed and well intentioned, and especially now in, in in regards to all of the NDA projects that shoot at least here in the southeast, um, there's going to be suspicion of like, especially if they were to see a phone in your hand, then it's like, oh, what are you doing now? Are you taking pictures of the monitor? Are you 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 trying to now now we got to flag this guy and go check his social media tonight, you know, and tomorrow and the next day. <laughs> Which I know that some of the bigger companies have departments that will troll social media just looking for those leaks. Um, so, you, yeah, you do have to be uh, very careful about that. Um, OK, so let's maybe back up to yeah. rehearsal. Anything I need to be thinking about from your department's perspective? Yeah, I think when it comes to rehearsal, you know, consider that if I'm doing my job well, I'm thinking about all of the elements that are going to contribute to the start of rehearsal. If you're only there for a day, maybe I won't get this far down the line, but as I see how long it takes you to do something, I'm adjusting the way that I'm doing my job. So, and it may not be you specifically, but the actors as a pod of people, you know, if generally when I say rehearsals up, bring them in, they're there within a minute or two, that means they're moving pretty quickly. And, and I can say we're ready when we're actually ready. And there's not too much of a lull there. If when I tell my staff that we're ready, it tends to take five to seven minutes for everybody to put down their phones and then go use the restroom and come back, then I'm gonna start saying we're ready five to seven minutes before we're actually ready. So your actions will tend to influence future actions and reactions from other people. Um, you know, if it if you're very fussy and when we wire you, it's a elongated process, you're going to get wired first and early. You know, if, you, if you're a person who, when we say we're ready, puts your phone down, gets up and walks and goes wherever you need to go, you're going to be called to set later. Uh, however you kind of begin your relationship with everyone, that's going to follow you, um, good or bad. And, you know, you know, three weeks down the line, you might be wondering why your call time is 30 minutes before everybody else's. And it's probably because you've proven yourself to be a person who's unreliable or you've proven yourself to be a person who's late. 
So eventually we start adjusting for however, whatever your actual behavior is, not your theoretical, you know, behavior uh, is going to be. But back to rehearsal. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when we call the actors on set for rehearsal, in my mind, this is a time when I'm giving the set to the director, producers, you know, um, and the actors. That period of time is when it's yours. Um, when it's time to figure out you're blocking when it's time to ask the director or assistant directors questions about what you should be doing, how you're saying this or that. But understand in a lot of ways that that rehearsal period, you know, what we would really call the blocking rehearsal, is, th is, is that. It's a time, and I'm speaking more from a kind of episodic television background, the purpose of the first blocking rehearsal is to figure out the words a little bit and to figure out where everyone's going to be throughout the scene, to figure out your path from A to B. Where am I going to stand when I'm delivering this line? Where am I going to enter into the scene? You know, which door am I going to use? Where am I going to stand for this part of the conversation? The, the the core logistics of the scene are what we're trying to hammer out in the blocking rehearsal. That may not satisfy every question that you have in a, as an actor and know that that's okay. If you feel like you know what you do and where you are, we can move on to the next phase, which is showing everybody the rehearsal and putting down marks. And the reason that we have to put down marks, the reason you see people putting tape on the floor and throwing tees on the floor is because uh, we have to be able to make sure that we have quality footage. And one of those major things is knowing where everyone's going to be at every part of the scene because there are first ACs that, you know, cameras are not autofocus. You may know it, but not really know it. But every time you move a, an inch or two, your focus has to be adjusted. So even if you're leaning forward once and then the next time you deliver it, you're leaning backwards, that's a different focal length for the camera. And depending on what lens you're using, the difference in turning the, you know, the focus is a lot or it might not really matter. The wider the lens, the less you have to adjust the focus and the less your positioning affects the focus. If you're shooting your close-up, you have to be really conscious of where you are and how you're positioning your body because every time you vary or, you know, lean forward and back or sway, there's nothing worse than somebody who sort of like sways back and forth while they're standing because you have to continually adjust the focus. So those marks are so that we can make sure that you do it as few times as possible. Because when we mess up, you know, and the, sh the focus is off, we've got to do it again. Um, so just know in the first rehearsal, we're trying to get down the technical aspects um, when I, as a first assistant director, then end that rehearsal, we're probably going to say something like, you know, the crew has it. And I mean that at that point, it's time for the crew, uh, the camera department, grip and electric, you know, sound department, everybody, set dressers to come in and start their part of the process. That's when you need to move away from the physical set. You know, I will often be seen, and directors do it as well, but once we move on to the crew has it, the best thing that you can do is leave the set, and you can keep asking questions. It's not that now you have to have everything figured out. It's just that now we have to move on to the next phase because the crew typically has a, you know, some amount of work to do in order to get ready to shoot. You know, it may be simple, it may be two minutes, and it may be two hours.
but we can't really start that process until the set is clear of the actors and the director so that we can get your stand-ins in and start lighting and setting up camera. So knowing that, you know, when we say the crew has it, that it's kind of time to move on, shift to the next phase is really important for me. Um, you know, a lot of times we're at a standstill. If, if I can't get people off the set, we can't really continue. That's great. And and there's a reminder in there that even if I'm perfect at hitting my mark, if I sway or if my physicality at that mark becomes unpredictable take to take or I establish something in the rehearsal, it not only affects uh, the focus, but boom operator needs to know, oh, I, I'm going to have to keep following this 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 person. And in this case where we just have this one softbox, like it gets distinctly brighter if I lean in. And so if I in the in the blocking rehearsal have done this and they have perfectly lit me and got me at the right, you know, F stop, which isn't like I know how cameras work. Um, but if if they've if they've lit me for this position and then as soon as like, all right, cameras, you know, pictures up, let's 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 roll the first take. And then I'm like, OK, here's my position. And then lighting is like, wait, what? crap and that now you're hearing uh yeah. crew talk of of either the actor needs to adjust or they're going to adjust to the actor and you know not having consistency in that yeah. and and that's not to take away the freedom of the actor to to perform but to understand that it is this collaboration with so many departments yeah and i think the appropriate thing to do nobody expects you to make a decision and then stick with it no matter what you know ultimately we have to work together and if as you get into a scene or as you rehearse it for the first time really giving it you know what you're going to give it it turns out to be different that's okay um you know i would recommend maybe just saying hey i was going to be here i really think i'm going to be here you know before i stop and and saying that you could say that to nobody everyone can hear you you could just say that you know maybe to the director or to the camera operators you know if you draw attention to it and just say hey i think i'm going to i think i'm going to be a little bit further forward is that okay and we're either going to say yeah no problem cuz it's just a matter of shifting the focus a little bit more or it might be an issue and we might need to talk about it a little bit and see if that extra step forward means we've got to relight, we may all come to the decision that it's kind of okay for you not to go that far. But it's a conversation that we should all have, you know, because if we can't make you look good and be in focus, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah. If, if, if it's not right, it's going to get redone. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a tough balance for new actors because sometimes you're, you're, you're acting out of a place of fear, a fear of rocking the boat, fear of asking questions, fear of looking new, which then can freeze your performance and make you look stilted. Uh, so it's that balance of of making your needs known if you're like, oh, but I have to reach this prop and you've now moved my mark during the rehearsal. Like maybe the standing comes in, they remark not remembering that the actor actually has to reach over six feet now. It was two feet. And it's like, uh, you know, say that before pictures up of like, wait, now I can't reach that. Is it, is it okay if I step over here? And then camera operator is going to pass that up the chain. Yeah. Or we may move the table yeah. over to you. You know, uh, I think, yeah, don't just, just know it's a, a while it, what I'm saying maybe makes it sound very rigid. It's a creatively rigid place where, we do have to eventually make a choice. The process of getting to that choice may involve a left turn and then a right turn and then another left turn, but ultimately in order for the crew to do their job, we have to make a choice and then repeat that choice. Or be very honest, you know, I have worked with a lot of actors that cannot hit a mark and we adapt to that and sometimes we put a big pink box and it's like, if you can just stay in this box, we will make it work. But if you walk all over the set, there's, you know, we're guessing at every, you know, 
you're guessing if, that they're going to keep going in one direction, but eventually if they turn around and go the other way, it's going to take a minute to, <laughs> to and then, and then recalibrate. You, yeah, and then you wonder in the fi final product why you're not getting as much coverage yeah. in the edit as, as you were hoping. I think, you know, speaking more to a, you know, what I would call a visiting actor, a day player, somebody with a smaller role, no less, you know, necessary and wonderful, but, you know, I think it's really important to have an awareness of, of how your character is, is in the hierarchy of the scene. You know, many times, you know, let's say a day player or people who are in a few scenes, essentially you're role creatively is to add to the world that the main characters are living in, not to be the focus of moments in the story. It's again, don't take that the wrong way, but if you're playing a waitress, you are absolutely essential to tell the story of how the main characters had a meal. But the waitress's choices are not going to weigh into the main character's meal conversation that they're having. So be honest with yourself. Don't ask too many questions. Um, some people want to make themselves valuable uh, or want to prove their knowledge or their competency. But the best thing that you can do if you have a small role is to essentially do a good job and no news is good news. Um, if you're not getting notes, it means you're doing a good job. And I know most actors would love to hear that they're doing a good job and you deserve that. But please know, unless you're getting notes asking you to do things differently, You've done perfect um, and know that your job is essentially to create this world where the more important storytelling characters are living. Um, and just think about the questions that you're asking. They may be great questions, but to me also a red flag for somebody who is very new or overly eager is somebody that asks silly questions about their character's motivations or, you know, uh, um, not to diminish, but there may not really be a motivation for the waitress's line about whether they like black coffee or with cream. It's just a tool to tell a story. To kind of summarize a lot of what we're talking about, it goes back to something you just sort of said offhandedly, which is get your head out of your phone. Not because you shouldn't be on your phone when you've got four hours of downtime, but that you will learn so much more if you're paying attention to what's happening around you. That also will help you discern the room and what questions do make the most sense to ask and which questions can I answer on my own um, or I can wait till later to ask them because they do not affect this next take or this this moment of my life. Um, and or am I asking the question because I really need to know the answer or am I asking the question because I want to be seen as someone who thinks they're valuable? You know, yeah. I, am I asking the question because I just want to be recognized for a minute? And I understand that desire, but I would argue unless your role is important enough to need to ask many questions. Do you make your choices? And if they get in the way of something that we are trying to convey through your character, then we'll give you notes. We may love them. You probably don't need to ask the question. Just do it. Try it. It might not work. That's what we do. We try things. Awesome. So then uh, anything else before we sort of come to a close here? Maybe after either between setups or lunch or even at the end of the day when when uh it's a maybe a picture wrap for that for that actor anything else that that stands out as something that veteran actors do or green actors don't do 
or or shouldn't do um, that you'd like to share? I think one thing that is a kind of tell sign of somebody who's maybe a little bit less experienced is apologizing. Um, just know people ask for lines constantly. It's okay. It's something that you can do. No problem. Nobody cares if you ask for a line. The act of apologizing for forgetting your lines is far more disruptive than just calling for a line. You know, if you're having trouble with it, just pause, say line, get the line, and then continue. Or if you need to go back, just say, can we go back to this real quick? And then just start back into it. A, nothing good has ever happened from apologizing to, for forgetting your lines. Um, and it's totally okay in rehearsals to have your sides with you. If you feel like you're going to forget your line and it makes you feel better to have your sides in your pocket or out, have them out. Until we're filming, it's okay. Um, you know, just... Be confident enough to know that you're allowed to forget your line and there are people there to give it to you if you need a line. That's great because uh, I, I, we see that a lot at the audition phase here at Get Taped where actors are apologizing for a lot of things. And other than apologizing for being late, like that's the only thing that that I th I say thank you. You know, thank you for, for that. That's cool. We'll do what we can. But if but every apology takes that extra three, four seconds and is taking you, the actor, further out of your character, which is just lengthening the whole process. And like you said, it's not doing anybody any any good. I think as far as once you've been picture wrapped, um, you know, it's totally appropriate to want to go and say, you know, thank the director, say goodbye to, to people. You know, if you're for instance, not near the set when somebody raps you, it's totally okay to say, hey, do you mind if I just go say goodbye? Um, and we do that all the time. We'll take you back, you know, just to, to shake hands, say goodbyes. You know, I think you got to you gotta make a, cho a careful choice whether you want to ask for pictures. Yeah. You know, if you don't have a, if you didn't have a scene or a connection with an actor, I would suggest not asking for pictures. If you had some chat, you know, if you had some relationship building, it's prob it's probably okay. But also know that some people don't, you know, some actors don't like it. They may say, I'd rather not. Um, and that is probably something they say to everyone. It's probably not just you. Um, you know, I don't take pictures with actors, but part of my job is being a normal person to actors. Um, I treat people as if they are Bob in the grocery store. I try not to treat people differently based on their awards and their notoriety. And to me, that works, that I have a relationship that's from me to you rather than a relationship from an admirer to a star. And I think you have to choose what your relationship is that you want to have to other actors. When you ask for pictures, you become admirer to notoriety. You know, you change the relationship a little bit and it might be worth it. You may, that picture may be worth it to you. Uh, but it also might make it so that you you feel a little bit kind of yucky afterwards that you that you deserve to be there and that you make yourself a little bit less than by asking to take pictures with people you don't really know. <laughs> you become a tourist essentially at that moment, yeah. And that can be. It's almost like try to discern if if you're right at that cusp where they might ask for the picture which sounds ridiculous, right, for that star. But if you, if it seems like such a ridiculous notion that they would ask you for a picture, then maybe don't ask them for a picture. But if you, like you said, if you spent that whole day or you're you're playing for more than a day and you have reached that point, um, like I had a, a, you know, a recognizable actor when I told them that I had worked, that one of my friends worked on a long project with them, they were like, oh, we have to get a picture. 
then that's her now asking me for the picture, which feels so much more normal than because it's we're doing it for this this communal reason as opposed to, hey, hey, can I get a picture before I leave? Um, which I've been there, right? I started off this interview talking about asking Pat, uh, not Patrick Bateman, uh, Jason Bateman and, and Ryan Reynolds for a picture. And and I when I see those pictures, I have that little bit of like like you're saying that slightly icky feeling like, oh, yeah. Because uh, they're not in their best light. It was freaking cold. They've got their big parkas on, you know. So, um, yeah, a lot of discernment needs to be had there. Um, and also, side note for actors, uh, sometimes thank you notes can can go a long way in terms of if you don't know if you're going to be able to get back. Because that director might be already being bussed back to their hotel if it was a long day and they have a turnaround. Or they got to get to the next setup. So they're just long gone. There is no opportunity. Uh, bringing a small amount of thank you notes with you to set. You can handwrite something, which sometimes goes a longer way. I've had people come find me, uh, whether it was the star in the scene or somebody, and say, hey, Matthew, I just want to thank you for that. Like, that was really sweet or that was really nice. And then now it's not me seeking them out. They're actually seeking me out to to say goodbye. Um, so that can be a, a way to to not have that anxiety of like, oh, I wanted to say, I wanted to shake their hand. Yeah. Um, because sometimes it's just not appropriate to try to stop things just for that little handshake. Sure. Any final words that you have for me or for actors? Yeah, I just think it's important to to be confident. Um, it's tough to get a job. And once you've gotten the job and you've booked it, you earned it. You're, you are valuable and you're meant to be there and go to work feeling good about yourself and uh, just know that there's a whole world there that's essentially meant to hopefully make your experience better. Um, nobody's there to mess with you or make you feel like you don't belong. Um, and if you don't have the the knowledge or you you're wondering what you should be doing or how you should be acting or what something that someone said to you meant just ask i mean there's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with just asking a question you know as we talked about before just maybe make sure you're asking the question because you need the answer rather than asking the question just to be recognized for the moment that it's being answered. <laughs> exactly. That's great. And, and that's such a, a nice, positive way to to present that. Because um, I think if we really do analyze our motives, sometimes we realize, oh, it's maybe not the reason I thought I was asking this question. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Wow. I really hope you stuck it out to the end. Such good stuff. My thanks again to Matt. Uh, Matthew, uh, Mr. Goodwin? Well, I don't know. That's it for now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on set.